Welcome to another of our Book of Mormon discussions. Today we'll be discussing Helaman 13 through Helaman 16. My name is Paul Hoskison, and I'm joined today by colleagues and friends from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. To my left is Michael Rhodes. Welcome, Michael. I'm glad to have you here. Okay. To his left is Thomas Wayment. Thomas, we're glad to have you here also. And at the far end of the table is Todd Parker. Todd, it's always good to see you. Thank you. We are discussing this uh, section of the Book of Mormon where there's almost an inversion of things that have happened earlier. That is, the Lamanites have become more righteous than the Nephites. That's explained back in Helaman 6.1. And therefore, the Lamanites are sending missionaries and prophets to preach to the Nephites to see if they can't get the Nephites to come up to speed again, to repent and, and to, uh, to straighten out their lives. And, the, and uh, the, we'll be talking mostly about Samuel the Lamanite today in these sections, but he's only one of several prophets, as the book uh, points out. Back in Helaman 6, 9, there were lots of Lamanite prophets who had been sent to preach to the Nephites at this time. But we're lucky enough to have this one account of Samuel. What a beautiful account this is. I know some of you thought about these multiple accounts and, and, and what's going on here. Uh, uh, Tom, I know you've, uh, you have some thoughts on this. Sure, I think one thing that's fascinating about this section we're discussing is that this is a section that's added back into the Book of Mormon as the Savior reviews the Nephite records. But to me, that, that's an interesting point of history. But to me, what's also interesting is when I read the prophecies, they're fulfilled already, even at the time the Savior appears. So he wants them to put back in this account that, that's already past tense, per se, but there's something in it I, I, he sees or wants us to understand, and it's something to gain, even though the prophecies are largely fulfilled. Uh, another thing I think we need to be aware of is in the, um, in the earlier chapters, in... Uh, <clears throat> In Helaman chapter 10, the Lord gives Nephi power, and he uses that power to seal up the heavens, and uh, he petitions the Lord, and he says, they're not repenting through the war, so let's trade in the war for famine, and then the famine causes them to repent, and uh, they, they humble themselves and repent, and uh, that happens around uh, 16 B.C., but then in uh, chapter 11, verse 36, they begin to forget the Lord, so within nine years, they're up and down again, and then chapter 12, you have Mormon summarizing Thus we see when things are going good, they tend to forget the Lord. And uh, in verse 3, if things are bad, that tends to bring people back to, uh, back to him. And so then we have the setting with Samuel preaching repentance. Yes, and one of his main messages is, uh, uh, there in, in 5 and 6, the destruction that is going to come upon the Nephites if they don't repent. And uh, it's almost as if this were had, had, had two uh, components to it, an immediate warning and a warning for the future of the Nephite nation. Right, I think, uh, see, in, in verse 3, it's interesting, he says, the, the voice of the Lord came to him. In the ending of verse 4, he, uh, he says he prophesied whatsoever the Lord put into his heart, and it may be confusing but, I think people. that's an important point, that, that La Samuel is, is speaking what the Lord wants him to speak, not what he as a Lamanite it would, might want to have spoken himself. Yeah. Right, and then over in verse 7, he says, Behold, an angel of the Lord hath declared it unto me. So that might be a little confusing. He says, The voice of the Lord, and an angel declared it. But if you go back to Alma 13, about 22, it says, the, uh, the, uh, the text reads that uh, it was the word of the Lord given through an angel. So, And we see that in the Doctrine and Covenants, whether my voice, the voice of my servants, angel, it, it's the same. So I think we might do well to start by reading his long-term prophecy in verse... Uh, Verse 5, if that's all right. Uh, yes, please. Helaman 13, verse 5. And he said unto them, Behold, I, Samuel the Lamanite, to speak the words of the Lord, which he doth put into my heart. And behold, he hath put it into my heart to say unto this people that the sword of justice hangeth over this people, and four hundred years pass not away, save the sword of justice fall upon this people. Now, I see that, and I think, that I don't know what their response was, but what would our response be? Uh, if we uh, went to conference and the prophet got up and spoke and he said, I prophesy that in the year uh, 2408 something's going to happen, we'd be just, I don't know if we'd care that much. We'd be at home watching and say, well, that's fine, pass the Doritos or something, you know? There's, I think there's another dynamic to this, too, is that we also have a prophet among the Nephites. So now we have Samuel adding this book. Thing that so far in the future maybe people are unconcerned, but we also have a, a, a Lamanite prophet, so how do they perceive that, an, an additional prophet? 
And I think, uh, see, and, and uh, Samuel's going to have a short-term prophecy in another couple chapters, right. so my hunch is the long-term prophecy is probably for us. They didn't have the record. We have it. We see that he says in 400 years they'll be uh, destroyed. It's about 6 B.C. They are destroyed in 385, so the prophecy is fulfilled. And we can see the fulfillment of a prophecy. They will see the uh, the later prophecy when he prophesies of the, uh, the birth of Christ and the, the signs of his birth and death. And I think it's interesting in verse 8 also there. Uh, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because of the hardness of the hearts of the people of the Nephites, except they repent, I will take away my word from them, and I will withdraw my spirit from them, and I will suffer them no longer, and I will turn the hearts of their brethren against them. This is the, the same kind of, of a, a prophecy that was given to Laman and Lemuel and their children, that if they turn from the Lord, the Lord's going to withdraw his word for them, they're going to fall under the curse of not having the priesthood among them, and their brethren are not going to think very kindly of them. So this is almost the same kind of uh, prophecy that's given to the Lamanites early on in the Book of Mormon. And here it's given to the Nephites by a Lamanite prophet. Well, if the destruction is uh, there and they're not going to repent, let's talk about what happens if they do repent in verse 13. But, uh, Michael, would you like to read that? Sure. But blessed are they who will repent, for them I will spare. But behold, if it were not for the righteous who are in this great city, behold, I would cause that fire should come down out of heaven and destroy it. It's important to note here that this isn't talking about the 400 year later no. destruction. This is a destruction at the time of Christ. And he's, he's saying right now, you people in Jerusalem, uh, Zarahemla, are so wicked, if it weren't for the, the few righteous among you, God would destroy you right now. And so, uh, this is, I, I think, uh, particularly uh, applicable to us who, uh, would like to think of ourselves at least as, as that leaven within a, an otherwise very wicked society that is keeping the society from being destroyed before the second coming uh, of Christ. President Kimball uh, did say that, that, uh, that we're, the nation has some problems and if it weren't for the righteous people in the nation, uh, that the nation could already be destroyed during his uh, administration. I think it's interesting to note too, if you see the footnote 13b, notice it's Genesis 18, that's the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. If, if I can find 50 righteous or 45 40. or 40 or 30, and they couldn't, and then that city was destroyed. Exactly. Yes. Uh, I'm always intrigued by, in verse 18, about this curse about hiding up your treasures in the earth and then not finding them anymore. Does uh, any of you have any thoughts on that one? I, I find it fascinating that in the book of Ether we see the same curse appear. and. Uh, I don't know, when I read it, and I, I honestly don't know, do we see that as a sign of end times, or do we see it as a peculiar curse to the, the inhabitants of this world, this uh, continent? I, I'm not sure. It's an interesting parallel, anyway. You don't find it, for example, in, in the book of Revelation, which no. is talking about the last days. It, it seems unique. And you know, it, it's all, I, I've often thought it might have something to do with uh, you know, rampant theft. You know, it says you, you lay down your sword, and in the morning it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, 